Special guests, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, hoik folk, can I welcome you all to this very special event where we remember in sadness the death of a revered and very humble son of hoik, but also with great pride a young man whose talents, skills and heroism have left an indelible mark on each and every one of us. At the conclusion of my few words, the Saxon band will play the invocation and Cormac Gareth Rennick will lay a laurel wreath We'll have a pipe lament by Robert Scott. And if I could ask you all to observe a minute's silence after the lament has concluded, please. This symbol of William Beatty's work, and more importantly his expressed passion for our town and its history, has remained a rallying point for teenies at home and abroad since it was unveiled on Thursday the 4th of June 1914 in front of thousands of excited townsfolk by Lady Sybil Scott. Lady Scott was the daughter of the Earl of Dalkeith, later to be the seventh Duke of Buccleuch and ninth Duke of Queensbury. While the horse is symbolic of strength and determination, the memorial triumphs the return of a young Callant, proudly holding high the banner so bravely won at Horns Hall. It's that young Callant that William Beatty has preserved for our future, and it's in his exploits and those of his predecessors that we so jealously guard as we remember over 500 years of a turbulent history for our proud Scottish town. William Beatty was born on the 23rd of November 1886 at Five Slitchick Barn. He was the only son of Thomas and Annie Beatty. Annie Beatty. It's a little surprise that he achieved his future skills having followed in the footstep of his father, an accomplished sculptor. William managed to miss the high school and his education and early life was spent studying at George Watson's College and the Edinburgh College of Art. He had a love of horses, being a member of a territorial horse regiment and played rugby for Lismore and Brunson rugby clubs. Kind of small clubs then. <laughs> he was also a member of the Portobello Amateur Rowing Club. So Hoyt can definitely say that the Spetch has honed the skills of more than one famous rower. <laughs> William Beatty was not one for letting the grass grow under his feet. And at 25 years of age, he was running his own business as a sculptor and ultimately landed the prize of being commissioned to create a memorial for his hometown. Before us, ladies and gentlemen, stands the legacy of that commission, a memorial destined to celebrate the history of Hoyk and to immortalise the name of William Beatty. During the unveiling of the horse, Mr Peter Scott of the Nitwin Manufacturers addressed the crowd and he stated, Mr Beatty had placed them under the deepest of obligation by the wonderfully appropriate design of the statue. It was an inspiration of a true-born Tiri. In their young sculptor, they had one who was a credit to his father and his native town, a Tiri in spirit as well as in name. He went on to say most poignantly, William Beatty is a young man with a great future before him and in no distant time would no doubt be one of Hoyt's most distinguished sons. Ladies and gentlemen, 1914, history and fate was to deal a cruel blow to that bright future for Beatty, with the First World War breaking out just two months later. At the start of the war, William had served four years in the territorials and was immediately called up to be a member of the Lothian and Border Horse. In April 1915, he was commissioned and posted to the Royal Field Artillery before being transferred to the 7th Royal Horse Artillery Brigade where the Western Front loomed starkly before him and his brave colleagues. He was involved in bloody and fierce conflicts during the next few years, fighting at Luz, Ypres and the Somme. On the 26th of November 1917, 
He was awarded the high honor of the Military Cross for bravery while carrying wounded soldiers despite being under heavy shell fire. That citation read, Lieutenant William Francis Beatty, RFA, Special Reserve, for, for conspicuous gallantry and devotion to duty. The neighborhood of his battery was heavily shelled and he heard cries for help coming from a track 80 yards away. He had once, once went to the spot with some men on a stretcher under heavy fire, brought two wounded men in undercover. Ladies and gentlemen, a true hero, although I suspect that is not how he would have viewed himself. I wonder how often during these difficult and dangerous times he quietly thought about Hoyt, the horse, and the brave count he sculpted. He will have remembered exactly why his memorial was such an important part of our history, but more importantly, reflecting on that young man sitting aside, astride a tired horse, returning home, triumphant despite the odds. In early 1918, Beatty was badly gassed and he returned to his home to convalesce. While at home, he was made a life member of Hoyt Masonic Lodge 111, where his father and grandfather had been members. The lodge holds the records to this day of where William Beatty signed that register. A little over three weeks later, William, who had been promoted to acting major, was back fighting on the Western Front at Jean Court in France, where he died from wounds at a casualty clearing station at Tin Court on the 3rd of October, 1918, exactly 100 years to the day. News of Williams Beatty's death brought great sadness to the town. The Collins Club placed a laurel wreath on the memorial with the following words, died of wounds, someone in France, Lieutenant, Acting Major William Francis Beatty, MC, RFA, a Hoyt Callant and sculptor of this memorial, in grateful remembrance of gallantry and sacrifice, the consummation of patriotism which this work of his genius ever commemorates, from Hoyt Callant's Club. The story of the horse of William Beatty does not end there. In 1921, some seven years after the official unveiling, William's father, Thomas, returned to the memorial and with the skill of a master craftsman and a loving father, he personally added a final inscription. Sculptor, Major William F. Beatty, MC, RFA, a native of Hoyt, born 1886, killed in France, 1918. In a further twist of fate, and in a simple but very dramatic way, William's gravestone at Tincourt Military Cemetery, France, bears the inscription. Major W. F. Beatty, M.C., Royal Field Artillery, 3rd of October, 1918. Brief families were permitted to have a small epitaph inscribed on the stone. Many chose psalms or verses that they were uh, comfortable with or words of uh, family nature. William Beatty's parents chose one word. Terry Bus. Thank you.
play the drum for fame did raise them. Poets of all times did praise them. Sung their feats in Maryland ballads. Scotia's boast was high scallants. Theory, fussy, theory, arden. Sons of heroes slain at Flodden. Imitating border bowmen. I defend your rights uncommon. Special guests, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, white folk, can I thank each and every one of you for joining us at this unique and very special event for the town. It's been a great privilege to work with an organising committee who I'd just like to thank on your behalf for their time and commitment to make this a night to remember. To the many clubs and organisations who have supported this financially as well as morally, thank you. I must also signal out Judith Murray Leslie Fraser, who with a team of patient volunteers spent many hours creating this wonderful poppy flow at the front of the horse. Ladies and gentlemen, what a fitting tribute of remembrance for William Beatty and all those other Hoyt folk and men and women who have paid the ultimate sacrifice. To conclude this evening, we have a very special song from our very own Alan Bryden. Alan has produced a number of very powerful, emotive and thought-provoking war-related songs. And tonight, most appropriately, he will sing A Place in My Heart a song written from the perspective of a Hoyt soldier thinking of home. Can I thank you all again for attending this Hoyt event and wish you all a safe journey home, Mr. Alan Brighton. <laughs> And I swear I will love 